All righty, guys. Welcome to our Prepare for Busy Season webinar. Um, gonna give everybody a second to join and um, get settled in, and then we'll do some quick intros and jump right into everything. So um, we'll give everyone a minute to to get settled. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Today is a great day. Yep, it is a fantastic day. It is a fantastic day. Uh, the weather here in the greater Northeast has gone from sort of unseasonably warm back to this beautiful spring cool. So nice. I just love that. Well, good deal. It's Catherine's birthday, everyone. So in the chat, be sure to leave Catherine a little happy birthday note. Um, we're we're super excited that she was willing to to do this on her birthday. Well, why so. not? Because then there's lots of people celebrating my birthday. That's, That's right. true. That's <laughs> true. Happy birthday again. It is wonderful, wonderful birthday month. Yep. That's right. Isaac's birthday was earlier. So yep. it is. It's a perfect birthday month. Yep. We share April. It's my favorite month. <laughs> okay. So it looks like the numbers are slowing down a bit. Um, let's go ahead and do a little intro and then I'll, I'll turn off my, I'll mute myself and you guys can let the experts take it away. Um, so we're super excited today uh, to be hosting Catherine from Nolan Consulting. Um, big fan of the Nolan Consulting Group. They have done some amazing things. So we're super stoked to, to be partnered up with them. Um, Catherine, I have a little bio about her here, but she's a senior business coach and the director of operations at Nolan. At Nolan sorry. So she's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, she's been with the organization for over a decade and has worked with tons of business owners at different stages of revenue cycles, industries, um, and just helping the team get, get all up and going. So she has lots of experience in helping you guys prep for busy season and lots of other um, important steps in a company's growth. So Catherine coaches businesses across the trades um, with specific focus and passion for organizations within the green industry from landscapers and excavators to nursery production and operations, which is perfect because that leads us directly into um, a little bio about Isaac, who's our CEO and founder here at Busy Busy. Um, he is a technology innovator in the construction industry and grew up as a, a contractor working every single position under the sun from digging ditches to um, managing, and then eventually started his own um, businesses in the industry and then created busy busy but um, biggest thing about Isaac is that he comes from the excavation industry and that's really what stemmed the creation of busy busy and needing to get the accurate data from the field um, back to the office and so yeah you guys will definitely hit it off even more so on the, the earthwork side but um, enough about me and my my talking here we'll let the experts take it away but um Either way, happy birthday, Catherine. We're super stoked to Thank have you. you join us today and love being partnered with you guys and looking forward and yes, to see I, what you guys have. I should add in, you know, we're so grateful for the relationship as well. I mean, you supported us at the Grand Summit. It was nice to have everybody there and the expertise that you lend and can lend our clients is pretty, pretty extraordinary. So we're, thank you for being a partner with oh, us. Of course, of course. Thanks. All right. Um, I will be here. If you guys have any questions, please chat them in or use the Q&A and we'll um, hit on them if they're applicable at that moment or we'll save them till the end. But um, yeah, we're going to let Isaac and Catherine share all their awesome knowledge. All right. Thanks, Bracken. Thanks for the introduction. Um, we sure appreciate it. And Catherine, so, so glad to be here with you on going through these tips. It's exciting, you know, summer season is all, always exciting in the construction world. It's like, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're past the winter and we're ready to get to work and get things built and get things done. So I love this topic of what are the tips that we need to go through to, you know, prepare for the summer season. And um, <clears throat> first off, I just wanna say, I love it that people are logged in to, to look at this because the one of the biggest keys to success is that you're literally planning. The fact that you're thinking about this, the fact that you're just thinking, hey, how can I prepare for this busy season? How can I deal with this in the best way to properly execute it? That that automatically you know, shows what kind of um, business owner you are or business manager you are. So planning, if you plan to succeed, your chances of success are tremendously higher. So so Catherine, I know you, you and I both get into these subjects every day, but for the five tips, let's start with talking about the vision because we, you know, I know we're both 
We both love vision. We both believe it's one of the most key ingredients to the success of a company. So before we talk about communicating the vision, should we, should we talk for just a minute on what vision is? Sure. I'm happy to do that. I mean, I think when, when we think about our businesses and the businesses that we lead, one of the first things that we do as a coaching group is sit down and understand where a business owner and the business leaders want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding a three-year pathway, a five-year pathway, even a 10-year pathway, understanding what that looks like helps us to determine what today's goals are going to be. Uh, so we want to start with that vision. Where do we want to go and what do we want to accomplish? Of course, the, the next most important step is once you've got that documented, whether it's a whether it's a single sheet of paper, whether it's a four or five, you know, paragraphs, whether it's five sheets of paper, whatever it might be, you need to communicate that to the team. Yes. Um, right. Because if you're not communicating into the team and it's stuck up in your head, what good is it? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I, it actually takes away the power. Like I, I've, in the companies I've worked through, I've, I've come to believe that vision is the single most powerful thing that you can do. And the reason it's powerful is because of that communication you're talking about. Um, I've always, you know, just thought about vision is just like, it's, it's like faith. You know, you, you put mm -hmm. it out there, you believe it, you say, hey, this is what we're going to accomplish, but you don't actually have the power to achieve it by yourself. And right. so you have to communicate it. And then that's how you get these great organizations accomplished is you're communicating your vision. You're saying, hey, this is, this is what the future looks like. And then you have great people that surround you and believe you and believe in your vision, and then they help you achieve that, which of course, that power can never be conveyed without communication. Exactly, exactly. And and we're suggesting, I would suggest that you do that at every single opportunity. I mean, you know, studies have shown that business leaders under communicate by a factor of 10, right? You always are, you're thinking that you're making your point, your point and, and it's not happening. So we think about that vision and yeah, I want, I want that vision to be starting when you're interviewing with people. I want the person who's coming in who might be uh, lacking in skills but have a great attitude. I want them to see their career path because you're painting this picture of what your business looks like in five years. So they they have no choice but to join your organization because they feel as strongly about your vision as you do. I, I love I love that you talk about that in regard to hiring. Usually, that to me that's how I decide. You know, when I'm when I'm interviewing people, that's how I decide who to hire is as you're communicating that vision, if they kind of get it, if it gets them excited, if they, you know, if they can see it and they start believing it, and you can kind of see that through the interview process. To me, I, I don't want to hire anyone that doesn't respond to the vision. And so I love that right. you, you say that, like communicate the vision, then you'll find out if they're really someone that belongs in the team, you know, do they fit your, are they going to fit your culture and your vision? If, if not, it's probably not going to work out really well. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, that, that's always something that I'm I'm working with people on, like read, read the body language of the person that you're interviewing, you know, and th so many cues can come across somebody who's going to be open to suggestion, open to feedback, open to training, yep. they're going to have open body language. Uh, if you're not getting that, if you're not reading it, that's probably not a good fit for your team. And don't, don't, you know, just think, Oh my gosh, I've got to hire somebody. I got to get this person in the door yes. because at least they're a body. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Don't, don't, you, you should be slow to, slow to hire, quick to fire. You should not. And, and when I say quick to fire, I don't mean it in a heartless way. I just mean, if someone's not a fit, if they're not a fit in your organization, if it's really obvious that they should not be there, you should be quick to, to fix that. But the better thing to do by far, because I know as business leaders, we hate to fire someone like that is the worst part of our job. If you ever have to let someone go, it is the worst part of your job. And so the best way to avoid that is be very careful on the hiring. Like you're saying, you know, look at, look at the body language, you know, get proper interview questions, try to make sure that you're really filling this out and making sure this is a good fit. Cause there, you know, at least my opinion, there's nothing worse. There's no worse job for a business leader than have to fire somebody. Oh, right. Right. It is, it can be, it can be demoralizing to the team. It can be demoralizing to you. And, yep. you know, it's so, so having to go to that dramatic a step can be difficult, but you're right. I think looking at your screening questions and making sure that you are hiring to your values. I mean, so we, we talk about vision. We started off with vision, but one of the other things that we're looking at are values and does the person match your values? So if you've got a value of contributing to your community, 
what what kind of questions are you asking to make sure that yeah. you're actually finding somebody who does that? So That's do right. you volunteer? Where do you volunteer? What are you doing when you volunteer? Uh-huh. Um, if, you're not, if you're not asking those kinds of questions, you're not going to get the right answer. Um, and, I, and I think too often we go for a skill-based question. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel like I want you as a business leader, I want you asking values and vision questions, right? Um, I want somebody who's screening to take care of the technical piece. So as a business owner, as a leader in the field, I don't want you verifying whether or not somebody has spent the right amount of years at a job or if they've done the skill or if they've done a comparable skill. That should be delegated out to someone else. Give them a very clear list of questions that you need answers to. Hold them accountable to making sure that they ask the right questions and are getting the right answers so that when you're sitting in front of somebody, you can ask those questions that are vital to moving the business forward. I I love that. I love that way to look at it because you're what you're doing is you're you're creating your first screening process as as the leader Mm -hmm. and hey, if they don't fit our vision, our culture, our values. Then verifying all the other data is no, it's it's worthless. We don't even need to verify that. The first screen is they fit vision, values, culture. And then second screen is okay. Let's let's make sure they've got the skill set, or if they fit the culture well enough, you might be willing to train the skill set. And, right. and often that's the case. When you find someone that fits your culture well, and and comprehends your vision and gets it, you usually are way more successful at training. One one of my favorite hires I've ever done. I took six months to hire this woman, and and she was my culture manager. So I, I hold culture really dear. I I mean mm-hmm. I'm like our culture, and so I I knew that I was getting too busy and I needed to hire a culture manager. And so I, and I said, okay, I forget the skill set. I'm looking for this type of personality. And then somebody said, okay, I, I think I know this, this lady that has this type of personality. So I interviewed her and I liked her personality. She had the right personality. Um, I took six months to hire her. And part of what I was doing is I was, I was talking with her on concepts. I was having to read books. I was, ha- I was going back and forth and just seeing how she responded and making sure she was a fit. And I know in the construction world, that's too long a time, most of the time to take six months to hire them. But the point is I took the time I needed to make sure that she was a fit before I hired her. And that, that is usually tremendously more successful. Well, I'm going to actually go back to that start with your vision piece, because if you know where your business is going and you know that in the next 18 months, you're going to need to hire an operations manager or a director of operations or a financial leader, I would suggest that six months is probably the right amount of time yeah. because you know it's on your horizon. You've built a big budget around it. You know that you're going to bring that person in. Have those start socializing those conversations with people. Look at them and see if they would be the right fit. If they are the right fit and you're ahead of schedule, that's great. Now you got to reevaluate the budget. But that's, I mean, with, isn't that a better scenario than, you know, yep. deciding tomorrow you need to hire somebody two weeks from now and not being able to do it because, you know, the vision is there and you weren't thinking about it. Uh, you, no, you're exactly right. It, it all it depends on the position you're hiring for, for sure. Some positions. Some positions, and, and the reason, like what I did with the culture manager, when you know this position you're hiring for has such a big impact on, on the culture, on the vision and values of your company, you know that position because you're really hiring a leader that's going to lead those values. You know, I do agree. You should take more time. You take more time yeah. and figure it out. Yeah. Um, I love that we almost naturally just transition. We have, you know, five topics here. We naturally transition to the second one when we were talking about tightening the screen and interview, interview process. And you started it, which was great, which is, and, and these topics do kind of blend together. They do in your vision and you're pulling it right into as you're building the team. And um, there's a there's a great quote from Peter Drucker. You know, he's one of the he's one of the you know, they talk about fathers of, you know, at least identifying and and um, working on modern culture, you know, understand culture. Mm-hmm. And he says um, he says culture we'll eat strategy for breakfast. And what, what he means, you know, at least what I take out of his meaning is if you hire the right people around you, your systems and your processes and and all the other things to make your business successful, will kind of naturally start to fall into place. And so you, if you can focus on hiring the right people, the people that fit your vision, your values, your culture, it really does build this amazing team. When we talk about building a team to get you ready for the busy season, 
that is it. It's the most important thing. When someone's really dialed into your culture and your vision, it is the best hire you will ever have. It will. It is. It really is. And those, they are, those people can be accelerators. They yep. can, and that's, I mean, I mean, there, we, we know of many business owners and leaders who, who aren't striving for huge revenue growth, who are looking to provide a stable environment, maybe for their family or the family of the employees that they have. Um, but it, accelerators, they help to make those things happen. And that good culture does that. Um, yeah. I, I do think that the, you know, getting, getting that screening process dialed in so that you can de- make those determinations quicker and sooner um, just helps you to build the right team. I mean, I, I, I mentioned it, you know, hiring just to have a body. Yep. I mean, you're in the excavating industry. You, you can't hire or you were, you could not hire just a body, right? Because there's licensing that's involved and a certain amount of training, but, but a lot of, of the trade organizations, they do, they just think, ah, I'll just get somebody because at least I can move the project forward. But moving a project forward is not the same as moving your business forward, is it? It's, it's not. And, and oftentimes when we hire just someone for a body to get someone in there to just fill the position, a tremendous amount of time we regret it because often the, a, lot of, a lot of mistakes get made and things get messed up and we spend more time in the project forward because we're trying to go back and fix those things. And some of those things can be actual, just, you know, technical things on the job. Like they can mess up things or do things wrong. And other times they can mess up relationships with customers. They can do, you know, if you just hire a body for a body, you can also do a lot of damage that you have to turn around and figure out how to undo and fix later. And so it's really, it, it's one of those things where you have to resist temptation, right? You're, you're busy and you need people to help you, but you've got to resist the temptation to just hire bodies and to move too fast before you've really properly screened them and interviewed them and said, let's, let's make sure you're a fit for our company and our culture. And, and in reality, you have to get this discipline. And it's one of those things like, you know, working out or exercising, whatever the other disciplines you have in life, it, it's not easy, but it's always worth it. If you'll, if you'll get disciplined about your hiring process. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's something that I, I think is really worth driving home. Discipline around the hiring process, getting it off of your plate as a business owner, delegating it to somebody else, isn't just about getting rid of something that you don't want to do. It's more about the discipline because I know so many people who are getting up on Monday fires, Tuesday fires, Wednesday yep. meeting, Thursday meeting, Friday. Oh my gosh, I didn't hire anybody this week. That's a problem. <laughs> That's right. Um, as you're speaking of delegating it to other people, I'm thinking of how, how we do it internally. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll have someone else begin the screening process, you know, like, you know, start, start, if I've got a position I'm looking for, and, and if I want to have direct influence on that position, I'll ask someone else usually that I have confidence in to screen it down to three people that I can meet with, you know, so, and because they have, you know, someone I have confidence in that has a good idea of the vision, the values and the culture, but if it's an, if it's a position that I'm interested in enough that I want to have some influence on, I'll try to get them to pre-screen it for me. And, and another thing that does is it makes me have to deal with it, you know, right. Because somebody's already started that right. process and they brought the people and they're like, okay, there's three people here. You've got to interview them and figure out which one. Right, right. Thing. You can't put it off another yep. day. <laughs> True. Yep. It is. It's, yeah. Hiring is just such an important part of your business. Um, in, in, the tech, in the tech world, we call it acquiring top talent. It's actually no different for the construction world. It is the exact is same it? thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you get your mindset thinking that way, if you think, you know what, I'm looking for top talent. I'm looking to hire A players or B players. And, you know, I've had other podcasts and, and webinars where we went through this. Like, what's the difference between an A player and a B player? Well, an A player is someone that fits your vision, values, and cultures, and they have the skill sets to do what you need to do, what you need them to do. Okay. A B player is someone who fits your vision, value, and culture, has the integrity, has all the qualities you're looking for, and they just need to be trained in the skill sets. And so you look at B players as future A players, right? You're just training them into the skill sets. And so it goes back to the common denominator, which is the vision. So you're hiring for the vision, and it really does pave the way for success. Right. Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, let's talk about how, let, I, I just want to 
real quick address. If, if I'm a business owner listening to this and I'm saying, okay, okay, that sounds great. You've talked about new hires. How do I communicate my vision to my existing people? I love them and I want to get everybody on board. You know, Catherine, can you hit that for us for a minute? Sure. Say, so, I mean, we, we would suggest, a, a, I mean, as I said before, over communicate. So uh, I like an all team meeting. I like an all team meeting at least quarterly. Uh, I think you could even do it biannually if if that's more makes more sense for you, just in terms of the kinds of projects that they're leaving or maybe, maybe the coverage area that you're handling. Um, but a meeting uh, of the mind where you are restating the vision over and over and over again. The second piece of it does your man is your management team on board? Do they get it? Are they able yeah. to communicate it? So it's not just that you can be excited about it, but can your management team be excited about it? And then by extension, can your field leaders be excited by it? So now we're, you know, we're talking about that cascading leadership. It's not just you, it's your management team. It's not just your management team, it's your field leadership team. Your field leadership team is then creating the excitement and enthusiasm amongst the people who are doing the work of the work. Um, and by the way, if I, uh, you know, depending upon the size of your organization, I, I would also then include, what does your admin team think about it, right? Yep. So whoever is leading your admin team and is your admin team on board because you don't want to have an entirely enthusiastic field and then have an admin team that's sort of, you know, lackluster. So it's about communicating, you know, over communicating and, and is everybody capable of repeating it back to you with that same level of excitement? Um, it, yeah. It's, you know, my mind's spinning as you're talking about community. <laughs> right. And, and part of me is like, oh man, I need to repent. I need to do a little better. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us just here. Everybody needs to be reminded of this. We True. do. Nobody is perfect at this. Yeah. Yep, we do. I can't even yeah. think of anybody who is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, the, the, main, the main goal, and, and the reason I mentioned before that I hired a culture manager is because if, if you'll just be intentional, if you'll, if you'll say, this is something I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to create a good culture. I'm going to communicate to my team and then start holding yourself accountable for that in some way, which my way was hiring somebody for that position, to just basically hold that accountable. Right. But if you'll be intentional about that, you'll start moving the needle. You'll start progressing. You'll start making it better and better and communication will hit stronger and stronger. Um, one of the other thoughts I had, you know, because we've got um, on our list of five things to talk to talk about, you know, we've got the building the team, getting ready for the busy season, communicating the vision, um, paving the road by lining out, you know, systems and playbooks. And so, and I know a lot of business owners are interested in that. They're like, okay, this is great vision. Now, now how do I, how do I get that down to my systems and my processes? And so I'm going to I'm going to tee this up for you, Catherine, because you've talked about communication so much. Um, right. In the construction industry, the the statistics show that about 32 to 37% of time is spent not on revenue producing activities. We're spending, you know, a good third of our time. So, so your crews are spending a good third of their time doing things that do not produce revenue for you, that do not get jobs, tasks accomplished, that do not produce revenue. And so what the tee up I'm going to give you is I, I believe that that's due to a lack of communication. I believe it's because we're not we're not communicating clearly. I believe most every worker really wants to perform, especially if you've hired the right people, they want to do a good job. And a lot of times the reason that there's that big percentage that's not focused on revenue producing activities is because a lot of times they're confused. They're not sure what to do. And the companies we've worked with that have the greatest success, even in the, even in the field, like breaking it down to what can I do in the field are the ones who meet every morning with their crew and say, here's what we're trying to accomplish today. And they'll even review. Here's what we accomplished yesterday. Good job. Whatever the case is, this is what we're doing. And here's what we're accomplishing today. And here's our goals for the day. And here's our goals for the week. And they'll make sure that every team member is lined out and they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing today, tomorrow, the next day. So they've got, you know, kind of that out ahead. And so really that communication is one of those very specific steps and systems that you can do to help your company be more successful. So absolutely. I'm, um, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, you know, so Brian, Brian Nolan is the owner of Nolan Consulting Group. His brother, uh -huh. Kevin, is the owner of Nolan Painting. Um, both of them read Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, uh -huh. a number of years ago. Great and book. one, right? Great book. Great book. Pick up that book, right? Yes. If you haven't read it yet, you got to pick it up. 
Yep. Because one of the things that he talks about is the rules of the game. And are you having a conversation about the rules of the game? Yeah. And Kevin Nolan does that. I mean, every week, rain or shine, holiday or not, there's a rule of the game meeting so that everybody in the organization knows what is happening. Jobs that are coming up, materials that may need to be staged, problems with collecting on uh, invoices. Everybody's involved in the in the rules of the game. And by extension, then his field leaders are doing the same every day. What are the rules of the game? And that means that the salespeople have to provide appropriate rules of the game, right? So this is everybody needs to know. And, you know, interestingly enough, I, um, you know, one of our, one of our coaches, Jim Bradley does a lot of work on lean and, you know, what it means to be extraordinarily efficient, um, and a lot of it is just boils down to that communication. Does somebody know what's expected of them at work? Yep. Do they know how to get from point A to point B to point C without, you know, having to stop at the store on the way, <laughs> you know? It's, it's so true. I, I, I'm, I'm a terrible dad, just so you know, I have, I have one daughter who I'm wonderful to, and then six sons who I torture. Okay. <laughs> And what I mean by that is I, I send them out to work because I believe that they need like that hard ethic kind of working. And I don't have them work for me. I send them out to work for someone else, right? So they can have that. And then I get to hear of how that went. And so anyway, I'm I'm terrible to them, but they usually end up being better for it. So, so anyway, my, my point I'm getting at, I'm thinking as you're talking about this here is my, so my, my son, um, he goes out and he starts working for a concrete company and he says, and, and I said, well, you know, how are they, are they training you? Are they talking about what to do? And he's like, no, they tell me to go do this. And then when I do it wrong, they yell at me. And then they tell me, tell me, go do this. And when I do it wrong, they yell at me. <laughs> and he says, he says, and after they've told me to do the job and after I've done it wrong, then they come and yell at me and demonstrate how that I should have done it right. And that, you know, and, and he's, he's just a young, I mean, he's just youth. Like he's never been there before. They know he's never been there before. Right. But they, they kind of do this after training. So it's like, after you've screwed it up, then I'm going to come and get upset with you and tell you that you're an idiot and you should have done it this right way. And it's funny, as a young boy, he's like, you know, it, it would work a lot better if they would show me how to do it the first time and then, or, or communicate, right? And, right. and what's, funny, what's funny, I use it as an example with my own son because it's funny how frequently that is how we deal with workers. We, you know, we right. tell them, go do this task. Oh, what, what you didn't know what you were doing. Why the heck didn't you know what you're doing? Right. And, right. You know, and, and instead of taking the accountability saying, Oh my gosh, I never explained to you. Like in his case, they want him to go hook up a trailer. It's kind of a serious thing. You know, there's safety issues. There's all these things. So he hooks it up wrong or something and they get mad at him. Well, what you need to do is learn to communicate like you're saying and say, Hey, I need to hook up that trailer. Have you ever hooked up a trailer before? No, I haven't. Okay. Let me show you how to do this so that now, you know, from here on how you should hook up a trailer. And, and just that level of communication, it, it not only gives you more success, but it starts building that culture of your organization because, because my son and, and, you know, I, I bring this up because this is your talent you're hiring, you're hiring people like this is your pipeline, like these are young kids that are willing to work hard. And this is your pipeline. What get what does he feel like every day and, and these kids you know I raise them to be pretty tough right they're not they're not tremendously sensitive, but he's like, you know. I really don't feel like that company gives me a great opportunity. So he's not planning on going back. He, he, right. he will move and he will find a company that communicates and gives him training and gives him, you know, ability to grow because he can see the way this company functions. I don't have a lot of opportunity to progress. And so when you do that communication and you're, and you're investing your time into your people and you're training them and you're saying, Hey, this is how you hook up a trailer. This is how you finish concrete. This is how you do this. They start feeling like, oh, I've got opportunity here to progress and grow my skill set and grow my value. And they start feeling like they have opportunity to become part of your team and your company and have opportunity. And the opposite is true. When you don't communicate, right. they start feeling like there's there's no there's no future for me here. That's right. And I we always I always would say that, you know, people, people, you know, working with business owners and they're saying, oh, we've got this hiring problem, we got this hiring problem, there's a problem, you can't hire anybody. I'm like, no, 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 no. We yep. do not have a hiring problem in this in this country. We have a training problem. <laughs> we have a training problem because business owners don't stop and invest the time and culture necessary to make training a priority. 
you're everybody had to start somewhere right right that's right you're so right and and it's funny if they look at it if they look at their own history they'll be like oh yeah i if someone dealt with them in the same way, they're like, I, I didn't like that either. You know, yeah. <laughs> what, would you work for yourself? You know, yeah. as, a young man, as a young man or as an, as an inexperienced person, would you work for yourself? You yeah. got to ask yourself that. And, and yeah. so, and communication really is the key. And, uh, you know, when you outline, when you line out the systems and playbooks, and we're, and we're on this topic of preparing for the busy season, it is just, you know, it's the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you'll take that moment to train someone, you'll... Mm-hmm drive them towards success. They'll progress more. You feel like you don't have the time to do that, but if you'll invest the time, they, you're, you're really investing in the success of your organization and they will continue. That investment will repay itself a hundred times over if you'll just take oh, absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I, I do, you know, I have a lot of business owners who, who you know, t- training as a, as a system is huge. It's enormous, right? It's, it's, it's more than someone can think about. Um, so break it down, break it down into smaller, more manageable systems. Don't think about, I got to train, I got to develop a training plan that somebody can go through from beginning to end and they could be perfect at the end of it. Start small. What does it look like to be an apprentice in your organization? Have somebody document it. Have somebody document it in Google or another cloud-based system that other people can then access and edit so that it's not static and living as a piece of paper in a binder in the back of somebody's truck make it come alive and just start with that. And once you've got that done, then go to what does it look like to move to a craftsperson? And then what does it look like to move to a field leader? You know, don't, don't, I think I, I know too many people who think that training is too big of a project. They can't start it now because they're just a small business and and it's the busy season and they don't have time, but you got to start somewhere. You got to create that system because Otherwise, you're going to be bringing in bodies off the street who are bad culture fits, and you know they're going to they're going to have an accident with a piece of equipment, and then you're going to be stuck in a workers' comp situation. <laughs> yeah, yep, you're, to draw you're, a straight line. Exactly, you know, <laughs> it, it, uh, this leads to more and more disaster. You think you don't have time? You're, you're actually creating more work for you in the future. You are, and, and you're taking away your future time. It's 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 so great. It's amazing that you know if you will apply the principles. I love I love your point of why don't you step into training just start small you know take mm-hmm. them you know you call them levels of your business i mean most most kids these days they, they're used to gaming they're used to leveling up just give them uh-huh. the ability to level up you know <laughs> exactly right exactly right i would then i would then you know add the sort of the okay if you're going to do that then let's let's take the time to understand what we're paying people by level yep. because then you you're building in an incentive to to train right I know that if I add these five skills to my tool belt, I can get a raise. So yeah. I, I want to add that in, put, put, put your pay rates next to your skill levels so that somebody is incented to learn. I love it. And, and that's a great transition to, you know, we're talking about in our, in our steps, we're talking about celebrating the, the wins, both big and small. And that's, that's one of the best ways to do it because you should celebrate. Like people really do want to be celebrated with acknowledgement and, you know, they want to, to do fun things and to be recognized for their skill set and, and their craftsmanship. And that's true. And you really need to do all that. But in addition, you should also really celebrate their their success by helping them level up in their in their pay scale, too. You know, I actually think it it's it's harmful when you just raise someone because they're they're going to quit if I don't raise them. So I'm going to give them a raise. Oh, I know. I know. So. I know. But if you say, hey, look, I need you to achieve this level of skill. And here's here's the steps to do that. Here's the process. And I've got an opportunity, whatever way you're doing it, whether you're sending them to a training organization or whether you're doing internal or whether it's through experience, you're saying, I need you to level up to the skill set. And when you do, I've got this much more pay scale opportunity for you. Now, what you've done is you've motivated them. You've created the goal in their mind. They're now looking at this goal and they're saying, oh, I want to achieve this. I can't wait to achieve this. They're thinking about it. They'll even probably start pre-spending the money that they're going to make extra. And right. so now they're driven, they're driven to this goal. Um, it's it's awesome. It's a great way to ex- explain it. And I, I'm going to add there, be you know, uh, there may be people in the world for whom that isn't exciting or a motivator or a driver. Those people are not the right culture for your business, Agreed. and you'll weed them out. Yep. And Agreed. they need to be weeded out. They need to not be there because if they're going to come to you, it's a dollar, an annual dollar raise. Uh, that that's not the culture. Not the yeah. culture. Yeah, that's right. I, yeah, 
I, I, you know, we've talked, we've talked a little bit about top performers. So top performer wants, they want to be scored. They want to be ranked. They want to know that, like, what do I got to do to achieve the next level? And they'll, and they'll work and they'll drive towards it. And those are the people you want to attract to your organization. So you really need to give them the systems, the tool set to be able to do that. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and uh, it's amazing that, you know, when we go over our five steps, I'm kind of glancing from time to time at these five steps we're talking about today, that we're really, all of them really dovetail together. They're all- They do, they really all, do. They're all connecting to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know re retaining, engaging your employees, making them feel supported. We're, we're literally talking about this exact thing right now. If you want to retain your employee, give them an opportunity or a path. Um, mm -hmm. We study, I'll just kind of throw this out there and see what you think about it. But we study, so I'm busy, busy. We study success and failure of businesses. That's all we do. Because our whole vision mm -hmm. is to support businesses to be more successful, more profitable in, in their careers. Because we study, you know, 70% of businesses fail or go out of business within seven years. And most people don't think they're part of that 70%. Like if I talk to a room full of people, seven out of 10 don't think they're going to fail. Yeah. Right. You know, so they also like they're in the success. Right. So, but the other thing is we also study what creates those companies. Where do they come from? You know, usually just like um, Michael Gerber talks about, they're usually a technician. They have the skill set. They come from that. Gun. Okay. So the, what I want to segue into, and I think it's a really good segue into retaining your employees and engaging your employees, help them feel supported is, do you know why the majority of people go into business for themselves? And, and the, the, owners they'll complain they're like i i raised this person up i taught them everything they know and then they went and competed with me you know and this is a this is a common complaint and what i personally like to do is i always like to throw that back at them the majority of business owners i've interviewed when i get down to ask them why did you go into business for yourself when i start pulling back the layers what i find out is they were part of a culture that they couldn't stand they felt like there was no opportunity there was no, they, you know, like, like one guy said, I, he said, I didn't want to start my own business, but my boss was such a jerk right. that I had to, I just had to, I was just part of this terrible culture. And even though my skill set was high, I didn't really have the ability to go anywhere unless I went out and worked myself. And his boss was so mad at him because he said, I've trained you. And then you went out and worked for yourself. You know, you went out and competed with me. When Gosh, really isn't that the ultimate compliment that raises the industry. I don't know. I always feel like when you, when somebody leaves the organization to start their own business, you've done something well. Okay. Wait, yeah. if you're a miserable boss, you've done something horrible. However, if you're a great boss and they've chosen done something, to do that, well. you've done something right. <laughs> this, um, uh, this is, this is the exact point I was getting at. It's the why, if you've created yeah. a, if you've created a good culture and someone decides to go into business for themselves, it's a celebration. Okay. But if you've, you've created a terrible culture, you've really just trained your competition up to compete with you and you've given them no option but to go into it. Um, right. So, I think the, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was gonna, I was gonna add, you know, that, that you know, celebration where I think we need to focus, uh, focus a lot of attention is at that crew leader, foreman, product, uh, project manager level. Yep. Um, often that level of employee in your organization is, is getting the direction from above and is getting newer and newer and newer employees, lots and lots of new employees. And they feel a little bit of that pinch. They feel the squeeze. And so reminding them that you want to celebrate the wins, that you want to create a good culture, that you want to stop in the moment and face the person who's got questions and give them your attention because that person is the future of the business. Yep. And it's very difficult for that level. And I, I, you know, I, I've given a lot of thought to it. It, I think it's because of being that sort of in that sandwich, like the sandwich generation, right. Yep. They're sort of in the yep. middle. Um, yep. and, and it's very difficult, but if they are not really creating an environment of success, then you are, you're going to, you're going to lose before you've even started. I, I love it. The often the term in the construction industry we often use is boots on the ground, right? Yeah. Those, those people you're talking about, they're, they're your boots on the ground. They're your people yeah. at the front of the battlefield. They are really leading the charge on, you know, what your company is doing, what you're producing, because there's so many things going on in the company. 
but they're really leading the charge or leading the fight. And you've got to get down to that communication with them so that they are, you know, it, not only they're feeling the pinch, but, but they're really the ones representing you. They're representing your yeah. culture and your vision and your values to people on a daily basis as they're doing the work. Yep. So it's a great point. I love that. Um, and when you talk about that particular person, we talk about, you know, retaining and engaging your employees and helping them feel supported. That person you just mentioned is the one who often doesn't feel supported. They feel like they don't get support for them in the office. They're fighting, you know, in the field. It's just, it's really great. Like if you took, if, you know, if you, if you take like, what are my assignments from this webinar? Like if I'm listening to this, I'm saying, what are my assignments, you know? vision, values, cultures, learning to hire for the right people, communication. But if you want to put that all together and, and, and take a task and say, what can I do about this culture? Do what Catherine is saying here and focus on <laughs> that person. Like you go out and you take that field leader and start practicing right there. That is your, would, yeah. that is your assignment. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would 100% agree. I would say what what is likely going to happen in the next six, eight weeks is you're going to stop having one-on-ones with those field leaders because you're just too busy. Yep. You're going to stop having morning huddles because you're just too busy. You're going to maybe miss a weekly operations meeting because you're just too busy, but you can't, you really can't. Those oh. are the most important things. I'm going to say something just absolutely a heretical, right? But but I want you focusing on your team more than your sale. I want you to be focusing because they're producing and yeah. you can reschedule a sale. Once you've lost an employee, they're gone. Yep, they're gone. Definitely. And and the sales process will become easier if you focus on your employees because you yep. will deliver, you'll have the reputation, yep. you'll deliver the quality of work and, and, it'll, and you, it'll just become easier. You're absolutely yep. correct, no doubt. And I know it seems radical because I, I, I have this question all the time with business owners, like, what do you want to do for your business? They say, well, we want to double, we want to get twice as big as we are now. And I'm like, well, why do you want to do that? And they say, well, because we want to make twice as much money. And I say, well, what if you just doubled your profit? What if <laughs> right, <laughs> you doubled right. your profit on what you're doing right now? And, and the key to doubling your profit with what you're doing right now is through that communication with your employees and getting them mm -hmm. and you will double your profit. Um, I often, you know, I, um, you know, often in the construction industry, a lot of our audience watches sports, you know, and so mm -hmm. I often tell them with this conversation we're having, it ties into this. They say, you, you need to realize you're the coach. You're not the player. Right. You know, if, if you look at any basketball team or any football team, the coach never runs out on the field and plays the game. And when you have the team captain, doesn't matter if you're the best in the world at your game. The team captain is focused enough on what they're doing that they can't see everything that's going on around them. And that's what the coach does. So the coach looks at every individual player, identifies the strengths and weaknesses, thing, places they need to improve, and they work on them. And in your business, you need to start seeing yourself as the coach. So you're going out and meeting with these crew leaders, Catherine talked about, and you're saying, hey, what can I do to help you? Let's talk about you know, how, how we can make things better. And you'd be surprised how quickly your organization will start turning more successful, more profitable, operate more smoothly, because you're starting to work on your business, not in your business. Absolutely. That's actually music. We need to cue music there. <laughs> <laughs> Settle. And yeah, that's right. Um, but it's, I mean, we, we, I am thinking of, you know, so many, I think there's a fine line between being a servant leader where you might go out and you might help somebody physically do something because they need that level of support, that servant leadership. Um, but by and large, yeah, you can't be doing it. You can't be in the middle of it. If you're in the middle of it, you don't see the big picture. You're missing out on strategy. You're missing out on opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You might, you know, to your point on, on some servant sort of leadership, the coach will pull players aside, not during the game, but afterwards and show them how to improve their shot, maybe do yeah. it with them, all that kind of stuff. Right but they've got to stay the coach so they can have that perspective of yeah. what's happening. So 100%. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I love it. This, it's been such a great, um, it's been such a great conversation, Catherine. I sure appreciate it. This we oh, yeah. these topics and you know, it's, it's fantastic. You, you know, I'm on this webinar and I'm, I'm supposed to be the expert and yet I'm thinking, Oh man, I need to do some stuff better. Right. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of webinars. I mean, I always, I always get whenever, whenever we do something like this, I always get, 
you know, reminded of the the things that I I should be doing as a leader. Yep. Um, that's continuous improvement, right? Nobody's that's right. right. Yeah, that's yep. exactly right. So fantastic. Well, yeah. As an employee of Isaac's, I would have to say I think he does a pretty pretty good job. But some of my coworkers may call me a brown noser for that. So okay. we won't share the recording <laughs> of this. <laughs> right, I was gonna say it's so <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, um, I really appreciate you guys joining and, and chatting with us today. We do have um, one or two questions that I want to hit on really quickly. I know we're right at that 45 um, minute mark, but um, as far as helping your employees feel engaged, question is, do you set different benchmarks for each group of employees? What What is the their reward at the end of that engagement? Is it big picture? Is it an individual bonus? So what are some engagements that you guys recommend to help them feel like they have control over it and are part of their success? I'll, I'll start if you don't mind. Because, you know, you're, you're saying or, and I'm going to say yes. I, I think a lot of the things that were mentioned, uh, we are a big proponent of a pay for performance plan. People should be invested in the success of the business. And, you know, wh when the job goes right, I want the people who uh, produce a job to be rewarded for the jobs going right. Um, one of our coaches, Steve Talkington, always talks about, you know, what's the pain point in the organization? What's the pain point? Find an incentive that highlights and improves the pain point. Um, I love that. I think that that's important for people to do. Um, but engagement isn't just about spending money. You know, it's not just about, you know, get, making sure that everybody gets more dollars or that you're throwing a big pizza party. Um, it's a genuine appreciation for a job well done. It's making sure that if you get report cards from your customers, that you're passing on the good word that the customer said about the employee. It's about making sure that um, the business owner recognizes when an apprentice goes from an apprentice to a craftsperson, that they know it. And they come and they say, thanks for a great job, not just to the employee, but to the person who trained them. Thanks. Um, we talk about that as being emotional coin, right? You have an emotional coin and you got to spend that with abandon. Spend it hard, spend it freely, give it out there because the people who need it are going to be producing the work for you. So I, I don't want to, I don't want it to only be pay for performance, which is very important and Barbecues are great and potlucks are fun and, you know, maybe a holiday celebration or two. Um, but don't forget that, you know, the, the coin that comes for free and the gratitude that you feel for the people who do the work. Yep. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, what I'll add to that is um, when I look at employees that feel satisfied, they do want to be paid for performance. They want those celebrations, but a lot of, a lot of high producers I know, they will feel satisfied because they're improving their skill set. Like as you're, oh, yeah. as you're engaging, yeah, you've got to make sure they feel like there's opportunity every day. And so I know a lot of employees that either feel satisfied or dissatisfied because of training or the lack thereof. Like if you're, if they're able to just keep advancing their skill set, they, they feel engaged with because that's, you know, that's what they're doing. That's why they chose to work for you. Right. Remember all the way back when we said, you know, vision is about where are we going and what what do we need to get there? You know, the person who started with you yesterday could be a salesperson, could be an operations leader, could be, you know, you're having a very clear career path or a learning pathway for somebody to improve. Yep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. From an employee standpoint, I mean, you guys are the experts, but I would... 100% agree with that. I mean, I'm not one to turn down a bonus. I, I love Nordstrom, but <laughs> right, <laughs> with that right? being said, also just being, being recognized for the work that I put in is always a, a, a major motivator for, for me. Um, so from an employee perspective, I genuinely, uh, genuinely agree with that. Um, yeah. I mean, the other questions are, are just very similar to that. Like success stories you guys have had with getting your, your teams on board for you, Isaac, and then what success stories you've seen with um, companies going into a busy season who grow their their culture in that way and and really set out these these five tips that we talked about, communicating the vision and engaging the employees to retain them. So if you guys each have a, a quick little success story, I think everyone would love to, to hear that. And then we'll let um, everyone go, go about their day. 
Yeah, I, I can I can start there. So um, when I was managing crews in the field, the highest production rates I ever saw, and, and I say that because we're talking about busy season, like how do we get people producing? Like get, you know, let's get that backlog work through, right? <laughs> the highest production rates I ever saw came from scorekeeping. If you will, if you will communicate, if you'll track what your people are doing and communicate that to them, most people are goal oriented. So, you know, quick story. Um, when I did, I did a project, you know, I'm in the earthwork industry. So we were doing a project for installing, installing sewer water line, all that kind of stuff. And I did what I'm preaching today. I, I removed myself from the production level. And this is when I was the project manager where I'm on the job. I am the boots in the battlefield doing the crew. I removed myself from the production level and I made it my task just to line out everything to make sure everybody had all the parts and supplies they need and every, every decision made so they could just keep producing. And then what I did is I started timing them. So I would time them and say, this is how much time it took you to put in one length of sewer pipe. This is how much time it took you to do this. And, and we'd go over at the end of the day and we'd say, this is how much we got it done yesterday. And here's about the average time it took. And I'd say, what do you think? Can we get lower than that today? You know, we were doing it in like 10 or 13 minutes. Can we get down to eight minutes? Can we get down to this? And I'm saying per length of pipe. Just by communicating with them, the score, you know, Catherine talked about communication. I was communicating with them what they were accomplishing every day, just like I said to sports, you know, if, if people were making baskets and nobody was tracking score, it wouldn't be as motivating. Right. So communicating score with them every day. We had the highest production rates I've ever seen ever in my life. You know, they just, it, it was amazing. The team just got excited. They got excited and just wanted to do it. They wanted to show off like Bracken says, I want to, I want to know, like, am I, am I being recognized? Well, some of the greatest recognition you can have is like some of my people have told me they just want to be part of a winning team. They want to know they they're winning. And so yeah, that was my experience. We produced at the highest rate I've ever seen when I was just communicating to them their score each and every day. Yeah. A little competition goes a long way, even if it's just up against, gets to myself. Yep. Um, yes. That it makes it more fun, makes it a game. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It is a game. It's all a game. Yep. Um, my story is pretty similar to that. I mean, you know, I've, I've worked a lot of the businesses that I've worked with, I've worked with for a very, very long time. And, you know, we have a, we, we coach to a structure. And one of the things that we coach to is regular meetings. Um, and this particular business owner was pretty resistant to it. Takes people out of the field. You know, I don't have time for that. I don't have the money for that. Um, and no, no growth, no significant growth um, until the year that the business owner discovered the the magic of meetings and now there are meetings and now exponential growth. Um, I tie that exponential growth to the fact that the team is engaged. They're completely engaged. They know what winning looks like to your point. They know what winning looks like. They know what they're going after. If they've got a problem, there's a safe environment for them to discuss the problem. They can workshop together uh, and everybody is moving in the same direction. So you know, something as simple as regular meetings can make such a difference. Um, so yeah, that's my, my success story. I love that. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of another quote from Zig Ziglar. He says, um, motivation is like taking a bath just because you motivated your team yesterday. doesn't mean they don't need motivation today. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> love Zig Ziglar. Yeah. 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 Well, I appreciate you guys. I know all the participants do as well. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Um, Catherine, thank you. We just thank absolutely you. love Nolan. I could harp about you guys <laughs> seriously all day. We're already over on time. So <laughs> thank you. Isaac, thank you for, for joining. Um, big happy birthday to Catherine. I asked everybody to message in the chat and tell you happy birthday, but I had the chat disabled. So um, <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's um, okay. But, I feel yeah, the love like coming people. through the camera. I feel the love. Good, good, good yeah. deal. Well, thank you guys. And for all the participants on here, we'll send out a recording of this in case you weren't able to um, join right on time and, and see um, everything from the beginning. So we'll reach out and um, send you a recording and we'll all be in touch soon. Perfect. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Thank you very awesome. much. Thanks guys. All Have right. a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye.